Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. In Philippians 2 it says, At the name of Jesus every knee must bend, every tongue proclaim, say it with your heart, say it with your lives, Jesus Christ is Lord. This is Daily Bread. I'm Father Al Lauer, and we're so glad to be with you, and we are teaching on, this is a subject that I think a lot of people have been uh, struggling with, how to get your kids to church, to go to church and go to heaven. I know so many committed Christians, and they love God with all their heart, and the, the thing that is just so burdening to them is that their children, that they have just uh, prayed for for years and reached out to for years, that their children are not sharing faith in Jesus with their parents. Now, that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, don't be discouraged. Be hopeful. God has got some good news for you parents. But we're going to start off praying. Uh, all right, let's just pray right now. We want to bless everybody. This water reminds us that we are baptized. We're children of God. We can talk to God and call Him Father, and that's an amazing thing, but we can. We have a new nature. We have been become new creations in Jesus. So we're going to bless you all and remind you of who you are in Jesus, and let's pray. Father, we come before you as your children. We come before you as being baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection. We come before you as temples of the Holy Spirit, and we just bring every family before you, and we pray, Lord, that these families would be one in heart and mind and one in spirit under the lordship of your son, Jesus. We remove all obstacles, and Jesus be Lord of whole families, not just the parents, not not just one, not just one spouse, not just half the family, but Jesus be Lord of all the families as every member of the family surrenders his or her life to you. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this is an important matter. I don't think we can talk about things that would be much more important because um, this is a matter of eternal life. I believe in a few years from now there's going to be a family reunion in heaven and I believe that God would make it possible for you to have that reunion and not one family member would be missing you have six children you have four grandchildren not one would be missing not an uncle missing not an aunt missing everybody in your family together with Jesus with you forever in the perfect happiness of heaven. Just think about that. Isn't that fantastic? Now, a lot of you might be kind of depressed about that and say, oh, it doesn't seem like that's going to work out that way. Let me share a few scriptures with you and thank God for the Word of God. The Word is our light. The Word is our lamp. Look at Joshua 24, a famous scripture, Joshua 24, 15. Joshua says, as for me and my house, that means my household, my family, we will serve the Lord. The Lord's will is that the whole family serve the Lord. It is not his will that your son is not involved in your Christian faith, that you can't share that together. That's not God's will. And God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Another scripture, this is actually Apostle 16. Lydia, first convert of the Western world, she 
uh, is baptized, but listen to what they say here. Acts 16, 15. It says, after she and her household had been baptized, God's will is that the whole family be one in the faith. That's why most churches, based on these Bible passages, will baptize babies if the parents are committed to Jesus. Because they know it's God's will that these children would share the same faith. And uh, they baptize the babies right away. And, and that's biblical. Acts 16, same chapter, a little bit further on. The jailer of the Philippi jail. Uh, in Acts 16, verse 30, he says, Men, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And we would just say period. But, but Paul doesn't say period. He says, and you will be saved. And all, I like that word, all, all, I bet you like that word, and all your household. Now that is fantastic news, brothers and sisters. Let's look at Isaiah now. I hope you're following along. If you can't keep up, uh, just write these things down. Or maybe you can um, borrow the tape. We don't sell the tapes, but you can maybe borrow it. Isaiah 59 and verse 21. Now listen to this one. This is the covenant with them, that means with the chosen people, which I myself have made, says the Lord. The Lord has made a covenant with you. He says, I want to promise you something. My spirit, which is upon you, many of you watching this program are filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And my words that I have put into your mouth, the Lord has given you His Word. You have devoured His Word. The, the Word is the joy of your life. You have the Word of God in you. The Word that God has put into your mouth shall never leave your mouth, now listen to this, nor the mouse of your children, nor the mouse of your children's children, grandparents, that's encouraging, from now on and forever, says the Lord. Now, wow, that is good news. That's fantastic. I know the devil's trying to make you feel discouraged and say, um, might as well give up. Uh, things are too bad. Uh, your, your kids, your grandkids are so far away from God. There's no hope for them. Let's look at Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, verse 24. They asked a question. Can booty be taken from a warrior or captives be rescued from a tyrant? There's been a war and some people have lost the war and they have been, uh, their possessions have been confiscated by the conquering uh, army, that's booty. Some of the people have been captured in the war, that's the captives. Now, after you lose a war and your property has been confiscated and people have become prisoners of war, can that be changed? Normally, the answer is no. But it says, surprisingly, Isaiah uh, chapter 49, verse 25, yes, yes, captives can be taken from a tyrant, and booty can be rescued from a warrior, from a tyrant, and those who oppose you, I will oppose. God is going to oppose your enemies, and your sons, and I might add for that matter, daughters, I will save. The war is for the children. The, the victory has been the victory of the devil to take your children from the Lord. But that can change, yes. The booty, the captives, meaning your own children that have been stolen from you and stolen from God can be returned to God and returned to you and returned to the faith. Now, that is fantastic news, brothers and sisters, tremendous news. Now, a lot of times people say, well, what do I do? I just say a little prayer or two and um, that does it, huh? Uh, well, I believe you have to simply obey God. Now, it's going to be the work of God, sure. But you'll be part of that work, and you just obey Him. Now, I'm going to share with you four biblical truths that are in this little pamphlet. You can send for this pamphlet. We'd be glad to send it to you. Whether you make an offering or not, that's not the issue. We will send it to you. And the pamphlet is how to get your kids to go to church and to go to heaven. Now, in this pamphlet, there are four truths that we want to um, emphasize, which 
are primary ways in which you will participate in God's saving work for your whole family and for your children. The first truth is Matthew 10, verse 8. The gift you have received, give as a gift. You have been saved. You have been redeemed. You have, have new life in Jesus. That's the gift. Give it. The gift you've received, give as a gift. Give it to your children. You say, well, I tried to, and they have not accepted it. Sometimes the parents don't really have the gift to share. Yes, they have a new nature in Christ because they've been baptized, but they're not living a love for God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. What you can share with your children is not a cultural Christianity. You can't pass that on necessarily. God did not say, I have my will is a cultural Christianity be passed on. He's, he's not saying, my will is that... that, that um, just going to church without really having a total commitment to Jesus, that you pass that on. My will is that a Sunday obligation be passed on. Now, he didn't say that. Now, that's part of it, but he wants a lot more than that. He says, my promise is, my will is, that a total commitment to Jesus will be passed on. Now, a lot of parents don't have it. And if you don't have it, you don't have it to give. So, what what we need to do is first look at our own selves, the parents, the, the adults in a family, and say, do I really love God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength? And if you do, God will do everything short of taking away that other person's free will to help you pass that on. He won't pass on just church attendance or Sunday obligation, or a code of ethics, or traditions. These things are all good, but he wants to pass on the whole thing, not just part of it. So parents should share their faith with their children. Parents should, should um, just periodically just start talking to the children and say, you know, I've raised you to, to be a child of God, but you need to make a personal commitment to that. What, what about it? You know, and you just you evangelize them. A lot of people say, well, parents, they can't really evangelize their own kids. Well, not always, but mostly. Mostly the person that should lead you to Christ should be your parents. That's the way God would want it to be. All right, a second truth. First one is you've got to have it to give it. Give is a gift what's been given to you. Matthew 10, verse 8. Second truth, Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20. Again, I tell you, if two of you join your voices on earth to pray for anything whatever, it shall be granted you by my Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. So it says praying together. That doesn't mean just showing up in the same building uh, for Sunday. That's part of it, but it's more than that. It means the word in Greek that joined together uh, me is symphony. Now, a symphony is not just a bunch of musicians showing up at the, at the same building. No, no, there's a lot more to it than that. They have to practice and really work to get it uh, a very close-knit unity, very, very detailed, deep unity, developed unity, where just everything is perfect timing. It's not like the violin is just play here and there whenever they feel like it or they might think it fits in. No, it's all pretty well uh, organized. It's closely united. That's what that word is in Greek, symphony. When we got a close-knit unity in prayer, whatever you're asking for, it's done. So brothers and sisters, the family that Praise together, stays together. Family prayer, what does that mean? It means the couple, the parents, just the two of them, praying together. It means the whole family 
praying together. And it means parents praying together with the children one-on-one. -on -one. And that, you say, well, we'll maybe have a prayer as a couple or one night a week and maybe for five minutes and get the family together another night a week for five minutes and pray with the individual kids, uh, well, every couple of weeks whenever we kind of get a chance to talk with them. No, I don't mean that. Every day, every day. Every day, couple prayer every day. Family prayer every day, one-to-one -one in the family prayer. You say, well, gosh, I'll be praying all day. Not necessarily. Well, you're supposed to be praying always, so, you know, you should be. But, but um, maybe not in that context. Just a couple minutes with the, with the individuals, a couple minutes here with the family. Maybe it would be nice to get more than that if possible, but a few minutes with the spouse. You know, this whole thing might take, if you do all three dimensions, which is what you should do, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So it's... Uh, it could be more than that. It'd be ideal if it would would be, but it's not like this is so so impossible, really. I hope you understand this. Third truth: first one is give the gift what's been given to you. Second one is family prays together, stays together. You join together in prayer. Count on God to really move. Third one: Ephesians six verse four. Fathers, notice that first word. Fathers, do not anger your children. Bring them up with the training and instruction befitting the Lord. You fathers should raise your kids just like Joseph and Mary raised Jesus. Do, do you understand what we're talking about? Um, you're, you got the same responsibilities they did. Say, now, wait a minute. They were raising Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. Yeah, but Jesus said, the Father said, the Spirit said in the Bible, you should raise your kids in the same same way and even though I'm sure this applies to mothers notice that they address fathers specifically here so the third point is the father makes the difference whether the children continue to go to church this is a biblical principle but it has also been statistically shown there was a study done a few years ago, and there's been other studies that corroborate this conclusion. Why do a few, some kids continue being active in church and other kids just kind of drop out sometimes for forever and sometimes for a few years and then come back? Why? They say, well, the ones who had a better education, religious education, they probably stick with it. No, that didn't seem to do it. The ones with a better family um, life where there was just a little bit nicer uh, lifestyle and, and not such a struggle to make ends meet, they probably were able to stay in church. Well, no, not really. And say, well, the ones where mothers were really committed to, uh, to the church and involved, well, that's sad to say, didn't seem to do it either. And say, well, the ones who, uh, you know, uh, ended up knowing the pastors personally or were involved in youth activities or something. No, that didn't do it either. There was only one aspect that seemed to make a significant difference, and that was the participation and leadership of the father in the faith life of the family. When the father went to church, kind of led the family in going to church, that made a tremendous difference in how the kids continued with church. That, may, that, that factor made a big difference, and all the other factors didn't seem to have that big of an effect. Fathers, bring up the kids with the training and instruction befitting the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. Now, our fourth point, I'll just review. First one, gives the gifts what's been given to you. A lot of your parents don't have that deep personal commitment to Jesus. Don't expect your kids to have it. Don't expect your kids to have aspects of it. You've got to have it, all of it, the total commitment, if you're going to pass it on. Number two, family that prays together stays together. Two or three gather in Jesus' name. That means that close-knit unity in prayer. Whatever you, whatever you pray for is done, Jesus' presence is there in a special way. Third, fathers, you have the main responsibility for your children persevering 
in the faith and in church. Fourth point, this is real important. Parents, not peers, should be raising, discipling their children. Parents, not peers. Let me give you two scriptures. Acts 2.40, 1 Pentecost, Peter keeps saying, in support of his testimony, he used many other arguments, and he kept urging, what is the repeated message, what is the refrain at the first Pentecost preaching? And this is it. Save yourselves from this generation which has gone astray. According to Acts 2.40, Peter kept saying that over and over again. He probably preached on and says, and once again, save yourselves from this generation which has gone astray. And then he said a few other things. He says, save yourselves from this generation which has gone astray. And he says, all I can tell you is save yourselves from this generation which has gone astray. He kept urging them about this. Another scripture, Romans 12.2, it says, do not conform yourselves to this age. Don't be like everybody else. Now, biblically, parents are to disciple their children. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the great commandment. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And listen to this. Take to heart these words which I enjoin on you today. Drill them. Drill them into your children. They're talking to parents here. Speak of them at home and abroad, whether you are busy or at rest. The parents have the responsibility. Now, I think a lot of people accept this in theory, but in practice, <laughs> the parents don't have that much time with the kids. The, the parents are just kind of glorified Taxi drivers, really. They, they just kind of take them from place to place. Here they are in the school. There's several hours a day there in school. And uh, the parents, uh, you know, come to a, two or four meetings a year uh, for parent-teacher conferences, and that's about it. They might help with the homework. I hope they do. Uh, then the kids are involved in all kinds of sports and other extracurricular activities and stuff. And, and they're mostly with their peers. So we found in our community, when we looked at it a few years ago, that parents were spending just a few hours a week with their peer, with their children, and those children were spending 40, 50 hours a week with their peers. We felt it should be reversed. Sure, kids should spend time with their peers, but a lot more time with their parents. Just simple as that. I think you should spend 50 hours a week and a real sharing with parents, maybe 10, with the peers, instead of vice versa. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's two big decisions relating to schooling. A lot of our people in our community, they homeschool their children, and of course that gives them a lot of quality time with the children. Uh, if you don't homeschool the children, you ought to really be involved in the education, biblically, and the Catholic Church has always taught that the parents are the primary educators. And I would discourage extracurricular activities except ones that you can do with them. Like my nephew and niece, they're in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and my, my uh, uh, sister and brother-in-law go with them and, and do all kinds of campouts and all that stuff. Well, that's great. That's good. You know. Or uh, if you're on a team... Uh, your son's on a team, but you go with them to the game and you, you're involved in it or you may be our coach or something. Hey, that's great, but, but, but be involved. The extracurricular activities should promote the fathers and mothers being with their children. And then, of course, you have to really cut down on the electronic ghetto that kids get in. You have to really just cut down on that. Otherwise, uh, they're discipled by the people on TV rather than by you. Come on, you have to face the facts. That's happening over and over again. I would say the main scripture here is Malachi 3.24. God's word is that his plan is to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. He, he says to get the parents and the children relating to each other. That's the goal. Peers should be in a very secondary place in in uh, influencing your children. 
That means major decisions as far as television, as far as media, and it means major decisions as far as schooling and, and extracurricular activities. Now, when you share all this, people say, I just wanted the kid to go to church. I thought you would just tell me to you know, tell them something that would kind of make them keep going even if they didn't feel like it. I thought there was a little trick or, or, I, or I could just kind of, um, you know, uh, say a prayer and hope they show up or, or make a rule that as long as you're in my house, you go to church. And you're telling me, wait a minute, I've got to change the schooling and change the media and we've got to pray together. I've got to pray with my spouse. And uh, the father's got to take responsibility. And if the father doesn't, the mother needs to really pray for the father and, and ask that God would work through her to, to open the father up to the Lord and say, wait a minute, this is not a simple matter, is it? No, it isn't. Not at all. But unless you just face what's involved here, it's not going to work. I'm going to conclude with Luke 14. And 28, it talks about a, a building, building a tower. And it says that um, you have to sit down and see if you've got what it takes to complete the project. Otherwise, you'll have a half-built house. If you're going to disciple your child, if you're going to have that family reunion in heaven, you're going to have to sit down and say, am I willing to do what's necessary to complete the job? Now, that's, there's some major decisions. Otherwise, you're going to have some half-built houses, and that's what we see all around. Children have got some exposure to the faith, but have never really developed and been built to what God wants them to be. We're running out of time here. Let's pray, okay? Father, we just pray for every parent to just obey you. We pray for every member of a family to just obey you. We ask, Lord, that we'd do anything. We would go to Egypt in the middle of the night like Joseph did if we'd have to, just so we can be used by you to lead every family member to eternal life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands.